Hi, and thanks for joining me for a very special episode of Spin Cycle. It's my opinion that the dark arts of spin and PR actually helped Muhammad Al Fayed evade justice. So I invited Phil Craig onto the show to discuss this with me and delve a little deeper. Phil brings a lot of knowledge and experience to the table as a serious journalist and also as an award winning senior producer on many international documentaries. He's seen a fair bit of spin in his day and he's debunked a fair bit too. Hello, Phil. Thank you so much for joining me on Spin Cycle. You're so welcome. It's lovely to be back and I'm uh, here trembling with anticipation. I've got my um, glowing microphone. I've got my opera house at the Australian bar. Where is it? There it is. And you're st- you know you're very welcome here anytime, Sean. Oh, that. good. All right. I'll just pop over. Yeah. Yeah. I am excited to talk to you about Muhammad Al-Fayed because I think you're well-placed to sort of delve into this really deeply. For those that don't know, just briefly, the BBC recently did a documentary and that opened the floodgates because they presented the story of 20 victims and since then hundreds have come forward to the legal team that is representing about 37 actual victims. So, Phil, absolute power corrupts absolutely. Does it also help you to evade justice? Oh, look, this whole story, Sean, is about evading justice. And it's also about a kind of awful, and I'm afraid to say awfully British, habit of colluding with powerful people. Um, You know, he was in the establishment. He had his tentacles everywhere. Actually, he was kind of half in and half out. We'll talk about Diana later because he he liked to play the anti-establishment card with her. But, but, you know, he was all over the world of business, the world of royalty, the world of showbiz, big events, you know, giving presents, buying off, buying favours, hiring ex-coppers, you know, lots of things that remind us of a certain Jimmy Savile in this story too, which I'm sure we'll come to. But, yeah, so you can bribe, you can bully, you can kind of get away with anything if you're a powerful man at that time, maybe not just at that time. There's all that, there's all those connections, there's all that power, but there's also the enablers that surround these people and enable them to continue to offend. Who do you think's worse, the people that carry out the criminal acts or the people that enable them to keep doing it and therefore there's more victims? You know, somebody asked that to Penny Chapman, who's been speaking a lot. She was one of his senior aides. And she said that, yeah, he, he tried it on with her many times, but she was too powerful. She could say no, but she saw how people lower down the food chain didn't, uh, didn't say no. And we're also kind of bought off by, a th- we're going to talk about Michael Cole, I'm sure. He was on my podcast on The Scandal Mongers not that long ago. I've currently taken it down out of respect, really, to these women who are making these claims. But he spoke about Mohammed Fayed as a generous man as a kind man. What Penny Chapman said is, that's true, but he used his power of largesse to kind of, not so much to buy people off, but to make people feel affectionate towards him so that when these things came out, their instinct would be to, oh, it's just Mohammed being Mohammed. He's going a bit too far. You know, he's always been one for the ladies. You know, that's how he kind of wriggled out of it. So there were enablers, but he kind of made it psychologically easy to enable him, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. And I think that happened especially when Diana died as well, of course, Um, you know, because at that point he was being publicly attacked for many of these crimes. Um, And, of course, he wiggled out of that, partly because there was so much sympathy for him for having lost his son. Yes, I remember that time and I remember I felt enormous sympathy for him. So, yeah, I guess also people that commit these sort of criminal acts are really often charming because they have to groom people. Also, I guess, like you said, uh, people can show two faces depending on who they're dealing with, can't they? And also, I guess, Michael Cole was rather dependent on him financially. I mean, he had a position with him on the Harrods board that was worth millions of dollars. It might be considered to be, you know, asking a lot uh, 
for someone to give up. And I guess he thought he was just doing his job rather well. But to counter that, I was really interested to read an article by Marina Hyde. And she did this brilliant article in The Guardian, also the Irish Express. And I just, I was really impacted by it. She was quite scathing about Michael Cole. She made the point that in the day, if you ever wanted to get a comment from Michael Cole or get him to come to the phone to make a comment, he was there before you even dialed. Like he, he was, he loved being on the record about everything. So she was quite scathing that he actually sent out his wife to present a statement. I've got the quote here, and I'll get your opinion on it. Uh, his wife said to, to to the cameras to the waiting horde, he found the women's allegations terribly distressing and that, of course, he'd been unaware of it. What's your take on that? Well, he obviously hadn't been unaware. He may have been unaware of what the, some of the latest allegations, but he can't have been unaware that other women in the past had made similar allegations and they'd been put in magazines and newspapers. And actually, you know, this is long before uh, the latest sort of stories broke. Uh, and this is really important. You know, Fire was inter- interviewed under caution by the police twice. Mm. over this stuff. Yeah. So I think people did know. Of course they did. Um, and the fact that the police never took it further probably allowed people like Michael to think to themselves, well, you know, he said, she said, I mean, this awful phrase. Um, and and as you said, because they are dependent on him for their jobs and because he can be charming. And let's not forget the power of cronyism. You know, if you are somebody's crony, you do what they want. They can be incredibly generous. We've all known people like that in our lives. But the minute you don't give them what you want or you complain about what they expect from you, then they turn nasty. Um, and it's, I think, you know, a testimony to the bravery of some of these women that they, some of them, and they were very kind of junior members of staff, they spoke out 20 or 30 years ago about this. They tried to get their stories told. They tried to talk to the police. And it just kind of disappeared into this kind of miasma of, oh, buck passing, you know, we're not sure, um, you know, the other women who've said different things. And, yeah, it's a disgrace. It really is. It's shameful, I think, for the country, for the police, for the prosecutors. And sadly, that was run by our, at the time of when a lot of this happened. Yeah. Our current prime minister was in charge of yes, the prosecution I service. And, um, I looked into I don't know whether that. it crossed his yeah. desk personally, but, you know, it's looks Yeah, bad. I looked into that, Phil, because I thought, well, you know, it's something to chase up. But, yeah, I don't know. He said, you know, it was people, it was a team that was sort of designated to look into it and, you know, it. I guess it's plausible that when the, that team came back to him and said, look, it's not necessary to pursue this, I don't know. I don't know. But, but there's something else, you know, we don't factor in enough, which is that there was a time certainly in the late 90s, around the time when Diana got involved with the family, when Fyde was seen as something of a hero here. You know, he'd helped bring down a conservative government, also by kind of exploiting the fact that he was bribing people, you know, these Tory ministers and MPs. He'd given them money for favours. He wasn't happy at the favours he received, so he told everybody about it. It was a massive scandal. And it really did help bring down the government. And it put one minister in prison. So a lot of people on the left, um, especially the, around the Labour Party, they sort of thought him, saw him as one of us a little bit. Like I said, he played the anti-establishment card, even yeah. though he spent half his life sucking up to the establishment. Yeah. And I don't know if that's a factor. But like I say, it sounds really nasty to say this now, but he was seen as kind of a lovable rogue. You right. know? And yeah, I think Savile yeah. was too for a while. Yeah, I think that's really telling the fact that somebody ended up in prison because that is really a show of power, isn't it? It's saying, look what I can do yeah. if I choose to do it. Just going back to Michael Cole briefly and then we'll let him off the hook. But <laughs> um, Tom Bowers' unauthorised biography came out at the time of Michael Cole's gig with Muhammad al it seems to me that it was quite silly for him to make that statement via his wife that he was unaware. I think that just laid, laid him wide open for people to sort of attack because it was well spelt out in Tom Bauer's biography and people knew that there was a lot of truth in that biography even at the time when it first came out. There was a lot of delving into it and also the other thing is Michael Cole actually negotiated the settlement 
with Vanity Fair magazine. And part of the settlement he negotiated was that they had to get rid of any evidence that they had. So to claim that he's unaware, you know, it just sort of, it does make me a little furious. I think he should come forward and admit that he was doing his job to the best of his ability and that, look, sometimes I think, do you think PR and spin and PR jobs do have to go into the dark side to protect their principal? Like, is it just part of the job? Well, I, I kind of wrote an entire book about Diana on that premise, you know, that some of the spinning that went on by her but also against her really did cross all red lines and it didn't stop with her death. Uh, either. Um, and then this was the world of the late 90s, the early part of the 21st century as well. It was very, it was kind of cool to be a spin doctor. You know, they were celebrated a little bit in popular culture as well. Um, I mean, David Hooper was the lawyer who represented Vanity Fair during that whole affair. He's been on Scandal Mongers and he's going to come back on again soon. I'm dying to talk to him more about this. He'll know everything that was in those documents that were then sealed. But one thing we do know is that there were very strong allegations at the time about the police, both serving police officers who did favours for fired, and perhaps even more sinister, former police officers who would work for him and would go around and kind of like be the heavies um, and would do favours for him, but also kind of put pressure on people. And like I say, some of these women who made the first allegations that were in the Vanity Fair article, they were from fairly poor backgrounds. They were not well connected. They didn't have many powerful friends in the media or elsewhere. And, you know, a couple of coppers turning up to say, well, you know, you want to take this deal, love, or, you know, you don't want to get yourself in any more trouble, do you, darling? You can imagine yeah, exactly. that happening. Yeah. I mean, and I'm I sure can. it did. And I think that's some of the stuff that's been sealed. Yes. Um, John McNamara. Yes. So he was ex police chief, really. He was very high up, wasn't he? And then he started working. He was really the fixer for my Yeah, he was a fixer. Right? And he's got a lot he, of questions to answer. I don't know whether he's made any statements. Oh, he's actually died. Oh, he's actually died. Well, there you are. Yes. You're way so ahead of he, me on the story. He escaped. <laughs> he evaded any accountability. But his name does crop up. It definitely crops it up. It does. I, and I actually went back to so. my files and I unearthed a, a note I'd written, a memo to myself in about 2001, a, a meeting I'd had with Henry Porter. Now, Henry Porter was the editor of Vanity Fair. He worked with David Hooper. To, 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 to defend their journalism against Fayyad's army of lawyers and detectives and heavies. And he t told me um, all those years ago about a lot of this stuff with the ex-coppers. But he also told me actually that when Diana first got involved, which was during this whole time where you know, the Vanity Fair article had been published, he spoke to loads of her friends. And they said, this is before Dodie appeared on the scene, that what they really feared was going to happen here, given that Diana was pretty unstable at this point, and I'm a huge fan of Diana's, as you know, but she was bouncing around a little bit between relationships. What they feared was that Fyatt himself thought she could be his Jackie Onassis. Yes, you can just see it, can't you? You can just see that. No, but yeah. it connects, you see, to this case, because this case was live. They, was, they hadn't negotiated a settlement. It was still going back and forward. These things take years. Imagine how it would have looked for Fired, not only to have Diana on his arm, mm. he was going to set up a charitable foundation. It sounds tasteless, doesn't it? He was going to set up a charitable foundation in her name, which he yes. would pay for, and they would global, be global ambassadors global. of goodwill. Yeah. Can yeah. you imagine that? Yeah. This guy who has now been exposed as a serial rapist and yes. abuser and manipulator was going to set up a charitable foundation with the Princess of Wales. Oh, my God. You made a really great point in your book and you pointed out that when she was having a relationship with Hasnat Khan, that it was all very secret. She was in the back of, you know, seedy little cars being ferried from one point to another. It was all hidden. It was all awful, not glamorous at all. But when she got with Dodie, all of a sudden she was she had that celebrity sort of fun young youthful lifestyle she could look fabulous and she could get photographed and she could be out in the open and Dodie could be openly affectionate with her and i thought that was powerful in your book and i haven't heard anybody else make that point but that would attract her it would attract any woman no well i spoke to about seven or eight other people that she was on the phone with that was on the phone all the time um God, she would have loved Twitter. But she was uh, talking to all of her friends at that time. And this is so important, I think, 
a lot of the previous relationships in the last couple of years, they had been sort of furtive and slightly illicit. And Khan didn't really want to be seen with her in public. He didn't want all the drama that came with Diana and the photographers. And suddenly, yeah, there she is on a millionaire's yacht with a handsome man. And I think you have to, we shouldn't forget, this is the summer that Charles is bringing Camilla out onto the public stage for the first time, really. The big high grove party is happening that summer. And, you know, the War of the Wales was a war of press releases and photo opportunities. Remember the famous occasion when Charles's uh, interview with Dimbleby went out and Diana turned up at the Serpentine Gallery in that yeah. incredible blue dress yeah, and yeah. blew him off the front page? This stuff mattered. It certainly mattered to her. And I think in 90, uh, in that summer, um, you know, there she was on the cover of every magazine on the world, looking stunning on a yacht with a handsome man, having the time of her life. And as she said to her friends, I'm here and he's with the Rottweiler. That's, yes. I'm afraid yes. she, wasn't, she wasn't above that kind of petty point scoring. No, I think no. a lot of women who've been dumped for another woman might feel some sympathy for that. Yeah, yeah. Well, Diana had a real nose for what would fly too. She, she was great at her own PR. You know, and she knew that those photographs would just take over the world. I she mean, was, that and that's why some of her friends say she. Some of her friends say, "Oh, don't see her as a victim." She was using the fires as much as they were using her, and that yes. she was going to move on from dirty. I mean, you know, opinions are divided. She told some friends she was hopelessly in love. She told other friends that it was a holiday fling and it would be over soon. So we genuinely don't know. Richard Kay, who was probably the the, the journalist with the best connections to her. He was convinced that they were going to get engaged. Right. So. Now, I find that really interesting because they were genuinely good friends, but do you think she was sort of spinning him this So, because she hoped that he would report on it, that it was serious? Yes. Personally, if I had to put my money down, I think I'd go with the likes of Rosa Moncton and was it Lu Lucia Flesher de Lima and the other friends that she was talking to who, who were a bit more cynical, perhaps because they were women themselves rather than yeah. Richard, and said, no, she's having fun, it's a fling. Um, you know, he's a rich boyfriend and he's on, it's the Riviera, it's the summer, it'll pass. Yeah. Um, One of but, the things that confused me, sorry to interrupt you, but just when you said about that, so she goes off on this yacht on this big holiday and Paul Burrell claims that prior to that she was actually quite repulsed and shaken when she came out of Harrods one day and he claimed that Fai had said, well, it's the Egyptian tradition that I hope you marry my son because it's the Egyptian tradition that the, the father gets to go first, which is just, ugh, you know, that's just so off. Well, look, he and had Emily, this. And Diane was shaken. Diana was shaken. Why then would she go on this holiday? Look, everything that Burrell says, you do need to take with a pinch of salt. That said, he was close to her. Um, he might have, you could imagine Fyde making it as a kind of tasteless joke. But of course he did, and this has come out in the allegations, had this like a medieval droit de seigneur, you know, the right to have to sleep with all the girls in the village first, because he was the big man who controlled everything, and that was his right. He did have that attitude. I'll tell you one thing, though, that I... And I'm glad you made me go back to my notes. I found an old, one of those old data blocks we used to have about oh. 2004. This is never going to work. So I plugged it into the Mac. And all, there are all these files. And I had a meeting wow, with somebody. that's exciting. Well, I had this meeting with somebody who was very close to Diana and also to Bashir. Now, Martin Bashir at that point hadn't really been exposed. There were still lots of questions about how he got his interview. But what? I had I didn't put this in my book, so it's an exclusive, I think, for, uh, uh, for for this podcast. He was still very close to Diana in the months that followed, right through the Hasnat Khan relationship. He was the one person that she trusted in the media, and he never reported on it, to be fair to Martin. Um, I think years later he did write about it. But at the time he didn't, and he was shuffling back and forth with Khan, passing messages and arranging things. Um, but some old... Some, this person I met said that he was quite instrumental in the fired relationship too. You know, that he, um, and he and, he and Burrell didn't get on, so they would almost avoid each other. But she turned to Martin for relationship advice, probably a foolish thing to do, but she did. And he was very keen on the fired thing, so I'm told. So I don't know whether that's another factor in all of this. That one wow. of the few people she really trusted. That makes it even creepier, doesn't pushed it? Him, it? Pushed him, pushed him Makes you wonder fire. whether... It, it then that brings up the question: Was fired even in on it? You know, 
prior and to do with the Bashir interview. Like it just makes you wonder how far all these tentacles went. I doubt he was involved then with the interview because that really was super secret. But I was surprised to, 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 to remember these notes because, um, you know, having given him this incredible interview, which transformed her life, I would say, for the worse, and set her on this new path, losing her private secretary, Patrick Jefferson, becoming, you know, losing her, her royal security, the divorce, and eventually the fires. So having trusted Martin with this, she clearly then also trusted him for relationship advice in the months that followed. Another very foolish thing to do, I think. Yeah. Getting back to witness intimidation, because I, I did want to make this point in this podcast, was that with John McNamara, there was a female that was working in Fired's office. Anonymously, she gave a lot of, she gave a sworn statement and a, sort of a, a really comprehensive account of what went in on that office to the Vanity Fair team. Now, John McNamara actually personally visited her, found out, somehow found out, even though she wasn't on the record, she was anonymous, and told her, I wouldn't go ahead with this if I was you. I would, you know, pull back your statement because I know where your parents live. Oh, my God. And that was John McNamara. So when you hear about this witness intimidation, it does give you the sense that this is why he got away with it for so long. But there was also false accusations, even against a powerful person, of theft. Uh, people ending, yeah, it was just crazy. And and one woman that rejected Fayed was accused of theft. She was dismissed, but she had the courage to pursue it. And she got a she got a payout of twelve thousand British pounds because she she was brave. But I mean, it would take enormous courage to go up against this person. Oh, it would, and I think that's when when they, when you're that famous, you're that all connected. You have ex policemen working for you, the best spin doctors. You've got private detectives, and you think, oh well, you know, did he really go too far? You know, there's no nobody else was there. It's my word against his. It's a really, it's so easy to believe that he got away with this. Yeah. I mean, you know, Tom Bauer's book. Uh, which I think was 2001, but he was doubtless working on it in the late 90s, turn of the century. You know, nobody could really feign innocence after that, and yet some of the worst things happened after that. Some of these really nasty allegations happened after that. You know, not only had he been uh, by then been condemned by, you know, the Department of Trade as a, as a fraud for his business dealings, he'd had to settle the case with Vanity Fair, um, you know, he'd been, he'd been into police stations, and yet... Until he died in 2023, he sailed serenely on and it looks like he was offending to the bitter end as well. I'm wondering, um, I, I can see the parallels with Savile. I can even see parallels with Diddy. I'm wondering whether you mentioned, I think it was in your podcast, um, a recent podcast in your intro when you mentioned about Fired, and you said that Harrods had a lot of properties, business properties, where he would, you know, let the people, powerful people, celebrities, stay in his properties in the heart of London. I'm wondering, do you think he had material on people that stayed in these properties for through secret code? Now, this is speculation and opinion. Oh, I I'm, I'm certainly did because... You know, a lot of people who went to the Ritz in Paris, and, and there are allegations emerging from Paris now about him as well, women who worked at the Ritz. A lot of people who went to the Ritz have said it was pretty clear that anything you wanted could be provided. Drugs. Wow. Company. Now, whether they're tape recording this or just making a log, that doesn't half give you leverage, does it? Some yes. A famous exactly. actor, you know, enjoys a little bit too much hospitality. Yes. They're in I mean, your that, debt forever. That would explain his sudden wealth. <laughs> he had a lot of material on a lot of powerful people. I mean, it's sort of a la Epstein, isn't it? If you've got a lot of video. I doubt he was blackmailing them. I mean, I, I don't think he was blackmailing them for money, but I wouldn't uh, at all rule out the fact that he, he, he made it known that he knew what they got up to at these various places. You know, the yeah. hospitality came with a price. Oh, there was always a price with Fired. There was always a price. Yeah. Um we see that's true of Savile as well, actually. I mean, he never, he was nothing like as wealthy as Fired, but he was able to open doors for people and he was able to try and involve them in his, the, the more sordid parts of his life if he could, uh, which of course then gave him a certain amount of leverage and protection. And he also, yeah. of course, had lots of former coppers 
working for him. Who would make do you, threats? Do you think there's enough delving into the enablers? Do you think there's enough? I'm not talking about Michael Cole now. I'm talking about Savile, the BBC, the willful ignorance, the turning the other way because they don't want to upset their golden boy. Do you think that there was enough follow-up and enough delving and enough people held to count that allowed all this to go on for so long? I think that's the real story. I think it's there's a bizarre chemistry of that time. And I was working at the BBC in the late 80s and right through the 90s. And I spoke about this. There's another little scandal that's broken in Britain. You may not have heard about it, about a man called Nithen, who ran a car currying car, a chauffeur car company. Uh, servicing the BBC. Um, and I remember when I worked at the BBC, a Niven car at the end of a long day or a long night at the bar, you know, a Niven car on expenses was like the ultimate treat. Yeah. And those Niven drivers, they were full of gossip. Oh, you'll never guess what went on in the back of the car the other night, so and so and so and so. Um, and it turned out, and this was only revealed a few months ago, that Niven and many of his drivers had criminal records for sexual offences, including paedophilia. Oh, right. yeah. So picture the scene. Oh, wow. All of this. So it's just like the culture at the time was kind of permissive. Anything goes, oh, they get up to all sorts in the back of my cab. You know, and it's kind of like, I won't say treated as a joke, but it's it's a kind of permissive culture. And within that culture, the real predators, the really nasty predators like Savile can operate. And then when Somebody says, oh, this happened to me in this dressing room or this happened to me in this taxi. People say, well, you know, like I said earlier, let it all hang out. Don't be a square. You know, th this is how we are. Even though it was probably a, illegal then and would certainly be illegal now. I'm, I'm not making a great deal of sense, but I think there was a culture of permissiveness and making yeah. light of these things before yes. Me Too that allowed not only kind of harmless misbehavior to happen, but some very harmful predatory behavior to happen and not to yeah. be judged and to be enabled. And yes. I think it was a cultural yes. thing. That's, I hope that's changed. Well, I think that was a form of defense too, because if they can minimize it and act like it's nothing really that important, well, it's a way of sort of hiding, isn't it? It is. Yeah. yeah and, and, and they did. Oh, you know, it's just one of those things. And I worked with Stuart Hall, a BBC presenter who went to prison. Um, and he was a lecturous man, and he would be talking endlessly um, about his conquests and the parties and the swinging clubs he went to. This would have been the early 90s, late 80s. And we all thought he was kind of rather gross, but none of us knew that he was also a sexual offender and was were taking advantage of girls in dressing rooms, like underage girls who'd come to pop programmes. Yeah, yeah. So, like I say, there was the the culture in which certain amounts of behaviour were, were accepted and that allowed them to, to go further behind closed doors. And then when people complained, we were almost always conditioned to think, well, it's just one of those things, isn't it? Mm. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, I did do. You see, you, did you see yeah. that in your showbiz life? Yeah, kind of yeah, thing? definitely. You knew who to avoid, you knew... <laughs> Depending on what show you were on, you knew who to avoid, you knew which dressing rooms to avoid, you knew who not to be alone with in the lift. Um, yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, but well, that was sort of nothing as BBC serious. BBC journalists, so I shouldn't name them, who were basically in a lift with, with politicians and pop stars who without even the, the merest hint of a kind of, you know, an approach or a smile would just be pinned against the wall and groped. Yeah. And never yeah. went to the police, like hands yeah. up skirts in the lift, just yes. by the by, by some politician or pop star. This was, like I said, well, that's the was, cultural soup in which these people swam. Yeah, and it was the it was the era of the liquid lunch. Like you said, there was massive expensive accounts. I mean, you'd go off for lunch and it'd finish at nine o'clock that night. And, you know, yeah. and it would just kick on and on and on. And there was so much money. And, and, um, a, lot and was, think, a lot of it was probably harmless fun. I mean, you know, a yeah, lot of it was enjoyable, yeah. but it, yeah. it, it kind of set a tone in which worse things happened and were not reported. I'm waiting for your next book, The Niven Car Files. There's a, all sorts <laughs> of stories about Niven Cars. Um, 
Yes, but, but items of clothing found on the back seat. They had a little collection in a, in a plastic bag in the office. Yeah, we thought it's funny. Was it funny? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. That's the thing. Yeah, we yeah, can all so be very... It, 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 all of this is a window hindsight. into a very, very different world and culture, and I do believe it's different now. I mean, yeah, do I, you think yeah. I'm being naive? Well, or? hopefully, hopefully. The one thing I think we're bringing up that is really relevant, though, is that there has been a bit of dismissiveness about the women that are coming forward with their claims. You know, people are saying, oh, you know, it's the typical office culture of the time and it's just yeah. a dirty old man chasing women around the desk. Exactly. But I think it's important to emphasise that we don't think that and that we are also drawing attention to it because there were serious allegations and that's what we're drawing attention to. And it it doesn't take much research to be able to pick up, you know, that there were, like you said, he was questioned under caution due to rape allegations. Twice. In two, yeah, 2008, I think, and the last one was in 2013. So on the record there were serious allegations. I couldn't get over. Um, it was the CPS said there was not a realistic prospect of conviction. That's the only explanation they gave after questioning in 2013. What that I means just... in lawyer speak is they didn't think the woman's testimony was so overwhelming in and of itself without any forensic or other witness evidence. That's what that right. means. Yes, yes. Um, and also <clears throat> maybe they thought that the witnesses were going to be intimidated. Well, maybe they didn't realise because so few so few had come forward and now we know there were many, many more. Yes. One thing that is maybe a little heartening is that the current Harrods owners and the current management are saying that they will not enforce NDAs. Mm. So if any woman wants to come forward and tell her story, then she will not be sued by Harrods. But the sticking point to that is the lawyers that are representing currently, there's 37 on the books uh, they've gone to Harrods and said, well, come on, give us access to the data. Mm. How many NDAs were there? Who were they with? We want to chase these women up. And they stopped short of providing that. They didn't provide that information, obviously because it's going to turn into a huge class action with more and more names. But, um, but I think, think that almost not, not only that, right I think they're worried do. there will be people around who perhaps gave money to policemen you know, that, uh -huh. that that suppressed evidence apparently includes quotes about people. Was it McNamara? Was it somebody like McNamara saying, and this is alleged quote from somebody who says he saw the file, it's amazing what these coppers will do for just a few readies. That's what they said. And they, they meant serving policemen. And some of them will now will still be serving and probably quite senior. It's amazing what they'll do for a few readies. What does that mean? Yeah. Look the other yeah. way, you know. Advise somebody. Oh, don't don't worry. It's, you're, never, you're not going to get anywhere, you know. Or it's fine. We've had a word with him. We'll take care of it. But if yeah. they're bribing policemen, that's yeah. really serious. I mean, all of it's really serious, of course. But that's so another level. So, do we need a royal commission, Phil? Do we need do we need more delving into? I wouldn't be surprised to see a public inquiry into Harrods if it keeps going because it is on the scale. I think. Mm. Um, it could be on the scale of Savile. Yes. Um, and th th there may be much more law breaking to discover, not just in London. Like I say, it's emerging in Paris now. Yes. And apparently right. Paris was where the real parties used to happen with the drugs late at night in the hotel rooms. Right. And they had half of the drug dealers on speed dial, you know. So it does sort of have real parallels with the Diddy thing with the parties, with the yep. freakouts. So there yep. might have been fired freakouts. I think Fred himself probably not so obsessed with cleanliness. You know, you had this weird obsession about having all these women before you abuse them, kind of checked out. Uh, I, d I don't think he, I'd see him in an orgy, but I think some of the people he entertained uh, were certainly enabled to have the parties of their dreams in the suites at the Ritz, you know. I'm glad and you the concierges were instructed the... to provide what was necessary. Yes, exactly. And I'm glad you brought up about the medical examinations because he does seem to be very worried about making sure that there was no sexually transmitted diseases. But what really distressed me about that was the fact that the doctors yes. gave away personal information to him 
and were in on it, I mean, what's happened to them? You well, would the, hope that the, that the, would the, be All of up. these doctors, and they're, they're apparently Harley Street's finest, will be members of a professional association with guidelines. You don't tell somebody's employer the details of an intimate examination before you tell exactly. them or, or at all. Yes. So I wonder if any of them are still practising. Well, like and... I say, public inquiry. I think this, yes. it lifts a lid on a kind of whole underworld of enabling. We started the whole yes. conversation talking about enabling. Yes. Um, and I think that that is the, the key word here. Lots of people, and they, they all told themselves, oh, it's fine and it's not too bad. And But really, they were all in on it because of the glamour, because of the money, because of the status, because it was fired. And he was kind of like a national character in the sort of soap opera that was British life. Do we think we'd need some sort of governing of, of PR people in that if they find out that their principal has actually committed a real crime, that they have some sort of obligation to report? A little bit like school teachers, you know, they they have to... They have to report if they suspect that a child is being harmed in some way. Should there be some sort of guideline? Because I'm sure that there's a million spin doctors out there and PR people that know really dreadful things that they're sitting on that they're helping their clients to cover up. Um, well, uh, <laughs> it's, it's not the same, but it's related. Uh, I was talking to Maureen Callahan, her book about the Kennedys, and the, you know, the efforts to cover up, say, Chappaquiddick. You know, the first people who are called are the spin doctors and, the you know, the kind of fixers. Uh, and then somebody says, oh, we better see if that woman's still alive in the car. You know, that um, definitely needs to change. I mean, yes. if, if yes, of course, if, if your principal tells you that they've done something that you think is illegal, I'm sure even under current law, you should be obliged to, to report it. Because if you're not, you're obstructing justice, aren't you? Yeah, it was probably never so clear cut, though. You know, it was probably never quite so clear cut, and that's how there's always wriggle room that these people have exploited in the past. Yeah, I guess we're sounding naive now because <laughs> we all know politicians get things covered up all the time, and I mean, yeah, it's definitely not the, a perfect the, world. To be honest, the biggest thing for me in all this, apart from the fact that these women need. Um, to, to, to get compensation and to see think that Howard's held accountable. But the biggest thing to me is the police. There's, it does look like there's an awful lot more to come out about how certain officers at that time were kind of available for hire, both before they retired and while they were serving. Now, that's something that maybe needs to be looked at, you know, st yes. statutorily. Well, if any more does come out, I hope that you will come back on and chat about it with me you because I'm sure this is way bigger than we've been able to cover and I'm sure that more will come out and I would like to follow it up and discuss it with you as more does come Indeed. Out. Well, we I'm should do more cycle. deep diving. I do like these deep dives on one subject. It's kind of Yes, quite nice. I think that would be fun, definitely, a monthly deep dive. I'm in. That would be great. I'm okay. in. And the Opera well, House says yes. <laughs> See you soon. <laughs> Okay, see you soon. Too. Thanks so much, Bye. Sean. Bye now. Bye.